Uh, someone asked a really cogent question, which is uh, grading weighting. Um, what's the weight of the final versus all the homeworks? And the answer is the final is worth two homeworks. So out of 100%, the homeworks are all 10% and the final is 20. Um, the grading, you know, whatever you call it, the, the way it'll be graded is the same as the homeworks, except that, of course, you'll, we'll only have something like three minutes a person to look at the finals. I, assuming there really are 53 of you, which is what, how many people were signed up last I saw, although I see now 10. <laughs> so, but of course, of course, it's only three minutes after the beginning of the hour, so people will wander in. Um, so what, yeah, so I think what we're going to do is set up some kind of a tag team thing where um, we'll set up a couple of tables and allow someone to be presenting while someone else is fumbling with their laptop. And I'll ask this again later, but if you have a patch but don't have a laptop, then you'll want to use a laptop that I'll provide, but all of my laptops are running screwy OS's, so we're going to have to work on that. I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe Joe's got a laptop that's got a normal OS that you guys know about. <laughs> oh, you do. <laughs> oh, we might hit Joe up. Okay. The other Joe. <laughs> Grown-up Joe. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, I want to do one thing to finish off filters, uh, although... Um, it being only one thing doesn't make it necessarily short. I'm not sure how it's going to work. Um, the first thing is an observation, which is that you can put delays on things. So filters are made out of delays. So I'm going to make uh, observation number one just using delays. You can see and hear it with, with long delays. That's to say audible ones. And then I'll go back and show you how it spins out for filters proper. And then I will drag all of you to the complex plane again one more time just to show you how this spins out in, in calculations that you can actually calculate the frequency response of any filter in the world. Maybe. Okay, so, so the main observation I want to make is this. I'll make a recirculating delay loop, which is cool, and then I'll show you how to make the delays go away again. Um, I didn't actually realize this worked until last year. Wait, I don't want to do this. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the signal and we're going to add a delay to it. Okay, so here, signal. Let's see. Let's, um, let's just do the microphone for now. So do we have a microphone going? Uh, oh, microphone so that uh, we can do things like have no delays. Now, is this? I don't know if that's... Is that amplifying still? Because it shouldn't be. Hmm. Okay, that's me not knowing how to deal with my mixer. But anyway, I can I can drown it out by doing this. Okay, All right. okay so microphone. Now, what I'm going to do is make a nice delay, just like you've seen before. So what that is is you say delay right. I'm just going to call it delay one, and I'll give it. I don't know. Well, we can give this a, long, a nice long time because we'll maybe want to set the time that we read it from. And then we'll have a delay read. And we'll give it a nice delay time that we can hear, like a fifth of a second. And I want this thing to have a gain maybe of less than one. So I'm going to say... Sorry, I'm just real. Yeah, that's all right. Okay, so I'm going to multiply it by some gain, and that's going to be a control. So we'll put down a nice number box, and it might be good to have it in hundredths. So I'm going to say divide by 100, and that will be the gain of that, and then we'll listen to it and see how it all works. Okay, so now, if this network does what I think it does, we'll hear me, and then it doesn't do anything. What the, oh, duh. Okay, and here's the echo. And the echo has a volume that I can control. And let's do something reasonable. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'll just say zero. Hello? Back to normal. Okay, so delay line. Now, how would you make this delay go away? The answer is... Now, why would you want to make this delay go away? To make a point. The point is that a delay networks and, uh, some delay networks have inverses. 
And that means that some filters have inverses because filters are delay networks. And so I want to show you how to invert a filter. And this is good because there's a reason this is good, but I can't. Oh, um, because it turns out that I can tell you how to figure out the frequency response of this network real fast and easy. <coughs> Basically, you already sort of know what it is because the resonant frequency, it'll, it's going to be a comb filter and, and so it'll have peaks at multiples of 5 hertz in this particular example. And you can, if you want to do the math, you can even figure out what shape the peaks have as a function of this gain here. Right? So if it's 0, it's flat, and if it's 100, then it's notching completely out 2.5 hertz and, and doubling 5 hertz, and then in between it's doing something in between. And you can compute that. And then if you can compute that, you can compute the one of its inverse, because it's just going to be one over it. All right? So here's... Okay, so first off, let me, uh, let me make the add explicit so that we can... Uh, so that we can talk about this as a, as a single thing. So this is a... Either it's a delay network or it's a filter, depending on how you think of it. And now we're going to run very quickly out of space, so I'm going to just sort of... I don't know what... Squeeze it. All right, so what's the opposite of this? Well, the opposite of this is the following thing. We're going to take the filter again. Oh, yeah, so how would you get rid of that echo? Well, all you would have to do is you would make the same echo. You'd have to use a different delay line to make the echo, of course. So we'll name it del2. And then we're just going to subtract it. So we'll take this thing and we'll multiply it by minus 1 and have that control this. And then if I take this signal, here's an I okay, so let's so here's a signal with a delay on it. Let's see if this works. Okay, so we're still talking and we're now making a delay. Hello. So now if I subtract that, that will make it go away, right? The answer is try again. So what happens is we'll take this thing and we'll make an echo of it that is minus the same uh, the same multiple of the original. And then we'll try it. And then we get... Okay, so what I forgot was... Uh, this made it... Okay, so there are two... There are two signals coming out of here, or there are two delay copies coming out of here, and they're separated by fifth of a second. And then I subtract that off, but of course it subtracts not only the original, but it subtracts the delayed copy off. And so what I really get is signal minus a signal that is 400 milliseconds later. Oops. Right? So how do I really get rid of it? The answer is I make it recirculate. So I could. So I'll take the signal. It, okay, so the signal now has a delayed copy. Now I'll subtract the delayed copy, but that will subtract another twice delayed copy. And so I'll subtract it out, and that'll make a three times delayed copy. And I'll subtract that out, and that'll make a four times delayed copy, and so on. And eventually I'll get them all subtracted out, and there'll be nothing. Right? And the easy way to do this is to make this delay line recirculating. So what I'm going to do is rather than just add the delayed signal into the original signal. I'll take the delayed signal, uh, let's see, add it to the original signal and feed it back. So this is now a recirculating delay. Oh, can I prove that? Let's see. Let's see if this is actually working as a recirculating delay by listening to it alone. Okay. <laughs> we have clarity problems here. Let's get this out. Okay. So there's the non-recirculating delay. Here's a recirculating delay, if I did it right, and I'm going to listen to it and make sure it really is a recirculating delay. By the way, it's got a negative feedback coefficient. Great. Recirculating delay. Okay. Now if I take that recirculating delay and apply it to this delay, so I took out the original signal, and I now I'm putting in a signal and itself delayed times 86%. And now, now you're listening to both delays. 
and we got rid of the delay. One caveat about this that will immediately have occurred to you, of course, if I made this gain more than one, then to get rid of it I would need a recirculating gain delay with a gain more than one, and that would be unstable. As a result, if I, put, if I made this gain more than one, at least this approach to finding the inverse filter is going to fail. Right? But maybe we shouldn't worry so much about that. Um, the next thing is, okay, so now I have this delay network that is just giving us the same thing. And um, slight observation is we could make this gain negative, and it's the same thing holds. Now what we got is the recirculating delay has a gain of 74%, and the non-recirculating delay is, is subtracting a copy of it. This is actually easier to think about than the other case. And again, as you hear, I got rid of the delay that we had before. Now, I've told you this, although I don't think I really emphasize this. Um, delay, uh, linear time invariant uh, things like this commute. Okay, so let's get this and put it up here. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch the order of the two delay lines. So now what we're going to have is this, uh, the original signal will go into this delay line. And it has 74% feedback. And now we have the recirculated version. Okay. And now I'm going to take that and throw it into this network here, the non-recirculating one. In fact, to save our sanity, maybe I should make them agree spatially with what I'm doing, right? So let's do this now. All right, so now we have a recirculating delay that you just heard, and then we have a non-recirculating delay that we will put this into, and then we will listen to the output. And now, do. Why is it delaying? Hello? Hello? What am I doing wrong? <coughs> Interesting. Okay. I have no explanation for why this isn't canceling out. Hello? Okay, now, just to be sure I'm not going crazy. Let's see, I'm adding, so I'm sending this thing into this delay line. Oh, that's not the output of the, sorry, I, d I did this wrong. I wanted this thing here. This is the output of the recirculating delay. And now we have nothing again. No delay. Okay, now, a quick analysis of this situation. Sorry, I don't know how to make this neat. Quick analysis of this situation. This is maybe easier to understand than the other one. So now what I've done is almost miraculous. I have this messy recirculating delay network, which, you know, you put it instantaneous sound and out comes a thing that lasts forever, right? And here is a nice thing that just cuts that infinite delay of uh, uh, train of delays out entirely, cancels it out. Why did that happen? That happened because, for one way of thinking about it is, at, um, when you studied geometric series in, in high school, they taught you that all you have to do to figure out the sum of the geometric series is you take the thing and multiply it by the number and that makes all the terms match up to all the terms but the first one, and then you subtract it and they all cancel out. The exact same thing happens here. The result of this network is a train of delays. Each one 77% each one as loud as the previous one. 
or as am, uh, having 77% of the amplitude of the previous version. So. And then, of course, if you apply a delay that takes the original signal and subtracts 77% of it, it the, that on the first one cancels out the second one, and that delay of the second one cancels out the third one, and that one of the third one cancels out the fourth one, and so on. Or to put it another way, this recirculating delay has a, makes a train of echoes, each of which is dying out exponentially. Take that whole thing and delay it, the same delay time, and then multiply it by minus 77%. And you cancel out perfectly the entire infinite train of echoes. Right. And the only reason you should believe this is because you just saw me pull it off in a patch. Now, this is cool for, or you might think that this means that now you can, whenever you have a recording that was done in a bad space, all you have to do is make the inverse of that space. Right, so, so rooms are, are basically delay lines in a sense, so whenever you talk in a room, when you put a microphone somewhere or a pair of ears somewhere and you hear just a bunch of delayed copies of the sound in a, in a very hand wavy way of describing acoustics, right? So all you'd have to do is, is make the network that cancels out all those delays and you could zero out the effect of any kind of room acoustic that you wanted to and start all over, right? So you have a, you know, you made a nice recording of someone, but they were playing in a horrible acoustic space. Just take the space out, and then you can apply any other kind of treatment to it that you want from the from the uh, original raw signal. Two things wrong with that. One is notice that this only worked. Um, oh, what? For recirculating delays, I think it's fair to say that any stable recirculating delay, you can make the inverse of it and get rid of it. For non-recirculating delays, you can only get rid of, you can only invert the thing if the echo is softer than the original sound. When that spins out into a real acoustic situation, it turns into a statement that you don't actually know, or you don't know in advance, that the inverse filter of whatever your room is is a stable filter. Right. A stable filter is, for instance, a recirculating delay that has a gain of less than one, and an unstable one is one that has a gain bigger than one. So, all right. So, there might not be a stable inverse to a real, um, to a real, live situation. The other thing is that um, you can't do it because, first off, you can never measure perfectly what the response of a room is. Second off, the sound source is always moving. You almost can't get a sound source to stay completely still. And even if the sound source were perfectly still, the uh, air temperature and, and um, air density in the room is constantly changing because they're air currents. And as a result, the, re the reverberation, the, 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 the response of a room is always changing enough that if you canceled out the reverberation of a room at any given instant in time, it wouldn't be good for any given other instant in time. And so you'd be out cold. So people have people have been chasing this fool's dream of trying to um, of trying to get rid of, of um, or trying to inverse filter reverberant patterns for, for decades, um, conveniently forgetting or inconveniently forgetting that it's actually pretty well nigh impossible to do. However, in this nice um, completely artificial simple uh, setup, you can do it completely. Now. So I told you that the reason that this was uh, going to be interesting was because now we can make, well, we can make inverse filters, that's okay, but we can analyze the frequency response of a recirculating filter if, if we can analyze the frequency response of a non-recirculating filter. So to make that, to make that audible, uh, let me get rid of the microphone, put in some noise. Oh, but I'm going to now have to drop the delay time of the filter so that this will so that this will be clear. So I'll put a number into the Dell read objects to change their delay times to something tiny like two milliseconds. And then we put noise in, and if I do it right, oh wait, if I do it right. Yeah, I get 92% right, recirculation. Oh, I'm changing the wrong one. but So now we've got a nice comb filter. And now I can take that filter and invert, invert it and reconstruct the original sound. What that also means is that this 
filter and this filter. I'll play now the original noise going into this filter, like this. So here's the inverse filter, if you like. This filter is the inverse of this filter. This filter is kind of ugly sounding, but it's the inverse of that one. All right. Um, and I told you that that was going to be interesting because we can analyze this one rather easily and it will take more work to analyze this one. Now, when you take engineering courses or other kinds of electrical, and, well, signal, signal processing or signal analysis kinds of courses, signals and systems, they will make you do algebra to analyze the signal or the system. And what I'm doing is trying to avoid the algebra by just sort of analyzing it out of thin air by making this claim about these two systems being inverses. Before, yeah, I should tell you a thing about this. Um, this is a perfectly good filter. Here's another one that has the, okay, so I could make one that has the exact same frequency response as that one simply by exchanging the two delayed copies. So right now it's a filter. Sorry, it's, it's the original signal and then it's minus 92% of the delayed copy, but I could take minus 92% of the original copy and then full blast the delayed copy and that would sound exactly the same. But that filter wouldn't be invertible because the second echo is louder than the first one and so if I tried to make a recirculating filter to cancel the echo out, it would be unstable. And there are... Uh, so, so there are two different forms of this filter, one of which, the one I've shown you here, is invertible. And the other way that you could put it together, which is backwards in time, is not invertible. Or at least it's not invertible with a stable causal filter. All right. Now, so how would you analyze the frequency response of this thing? Well, I've sort of told you. In fact, you can almost do it in your head if we, if we say that the gain is, is flat out 1. Yeah, if, if the gain here is either 1 or, or it's minus 1, then we can make a claim about what the frequency response should be pretty easily because you're simply adding a, um, think, of putting a think of putting a cosine wave in. What comes out is a cosine wave and it's self-delayed. And the sum of a cosine wave and a delayed copy of it, that's trig, which you can handle pretty, uh, not quite in your head, but it's pretty easy to do. Um, However, when, the, when this gain is not 1, it takes a little bit more work, and so I'm going to draw you a picture to show you how you might think about that. Um, as usual, as soon as the trig gets hard, the right thing to do is avoid dealing with the trig by jumping into the complex plane. So we will spend 10 minutes looking at the complex plane, and then we will forget the complex plane forever, unless I end up showing you the Fourier transform next time, but maybe we won't have time for that. So here is <coughs> here is the thing that I just showed you. Um, this, all right, now th this is out of chapter 8 of the book, and we've set all the delay times equal to 1 now because we're making filters. So the deal there is comb filters are filters per perfectly all right, but if you make a filter or a comb filter whose first resonant frequency is the whole sample rate, then it doesn't act like a comb filter at all. It acts like something that only does its thing once in the entire audible frequency range. It doesn't do the combing thing. So this is the way you do a filter. And, and here what I'm doing is making a number capital Q for reasons that you'll see in the book. There's, I had to name the variables carefully. And then we'll subtract that from the incoming signal. And the reason that we're subtracting here is because, as shown in the patch, um, by convention, yeah, it's convention. By convention, you think of the recirculating filter, this, this one, as having the positive coefficient. It doesn't have to. I could make this coefficient negative if I wanted to, like that. And all the, goods, all the same things would happen. We have that and this, and those two things are still inverse filters. But by convention, one uses the recirculating coefficient as the variable that one names capital P or capital Q, depending on whether we're recirculating or not. 
So as a result, since we're going to be talking about the inverse filter, the inverse filter is going to be subtracting, that's to say taking some negative, well, anyway, subtracting some, uh, some coefficient times this del root. Okay. Um, to tie this in with last time, of course, this is a real valued comb filter. And one of the things that I showed you last time was how to make a recirculating comb filter whose feedback coefficient was a complex number. And there is, in fact, no reason at all that this number has to be a real number. It could be a complex number. I just made it a real number so that I could make the network easily and show you this inverse property. But if we were using complex numbers, which means delays, pairs of delay lines, and then doing complex arithmetic on them, then all of this stuff is still hold. And then we could be doing things like making band pass and, and stop band filters. All right. So now, in fact, over here, uh, if, if you're reading through on, um, if you're reading through chapter eight while I'm doing this, these are already complex numbers because the the uh, hypothetical reader of the book is completely bathed in complex analysis by this time. Right. Okay. Now, here then is how you analyze that. I'm going to skip the equations and just show you what you what you get. So this Q, here's a, here's a complex number, and this is the, well, it was real when I showed it to you, but this is the recirculation of a, hmm. if you think of a pair of filters that are inverse, this was either going to be the recirculating coefficient of the inverse of the recirculating filter, or it's going to be just the coefficient of the non-recirculating filter, except it's going to be with a minus sign. All right, so the minus sign is still up here. There, okay. Now, oh yeah, so what happens up here? So again, um, ooh, yeah. So again, we, we imagine that we're going to put a sinusoid into the system. And a sinusoid in complex number land means the following thing. You choose a good number Z, capital Z, which is on the unit circle. So here's the number z. And the number z encodes the frequency of a complex exponential. So the, or encodes the frequency of a sinusoid. So now you think the sinusoid is the points 1, z, z squared, z cubed, z to the fourth, z to the fifth, and so on forever. And of course, when we listen to this, we're just going to take the real part. So we're going to project down onto the real axis, and it's going to look like a cosine. But, the, in, but in truth, the real signal, the, 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 um, the thing that's happening underneath is that there's a complex number spinning around the unit circle. And the trick is that each, each new sample is simply z times the previous one. Right. So now we know how to talk about delaying that one sample. Delaying it a sample is simply dividing the signal by z. Why dividing? Because if you have one z, z squared, and if you delay it, you get 1, z, z squared, and it's 1 over z times the signal that you hadn't delayed. That's confusing, but it's important to remember that 1 over. Okay, 1 over z, by the way, is just this number down here, which is what you get when you take z and reflect it around the unit circle. It's z to the minus 1 power, and uh, so it's down here. All right? So now what we have is, we have the original signal, which is the signal times 1, and then we have the signal times z to the minus 1 because we delayed it, and times q because we multiplied it by q in the network. Okay, so let's go back to the network and just check. So here is qz to the minus 1. Here is z to the minus 1, which is the delay, and here is q, and we're going to subtract. Right. Now this isn't even figurative. This is uh, well, this is figurative when you're uh, when you're in electrical engineering, but this is real for us because we're th we're thinking that we're putting a, s a complex exponential signal, which is a si a complex sinusoid, into this, and so this really is multiplication by one over z or z to the minus one, and this really is multiplication by q because it is, and this is just subtraction. Right. Okay. So so here is the left side of the thing, and here's the right side of the thing, which is the signal multiplied by q to the z minus 1. In other words, the, the signal is multiplied by 1, and it's multiplied by z, qz to the minus 1, and then you subtract the 2. 
So it's 1 minus qz to the minus 1, which is to say it is a complex number which, is a, uh, which gets from here to here. So if you think of it as a vector, it's the short vector which starts here and points there. So the way I drew it, it looks like, it, uh, it looks like that's a very small number. But the number, in fact, is going to range from 0 to 2. And this amplitude, this, this thing 1 minus qz to the minus 1, its size, its absolute value, is the gain, the frequency response of the filter at the frequency z. So q is a parameter of the filter. You can control it, but it's, you can treat it like a constant. z is a thing which depends on the frequency that's going in. And in fact, you think of a signal perhaps as consisting of many or even an infinitude of sinusoidal components going in, all with different values of z. Right? So q is fixed and z is, 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 is everything at once in some sense. And the easy way to think about that is not to have is not to think about how qz to the minus one changes, but to multiply the whole thing by z to get this picture. So now we have z, which is which encodes the frequency of the sinusoid, and here's q, which is the coefficient. And now, as we imagine looking at values of z that, that could range all the way around the unit circle, you see that there's an area of the unit circle where the values of z are close to q, and those are areas where the gain of the filter is low small. And around here on the other side, the gain of the filter, the gains of the filter are large. And the gain of the filter, in fact, is nothing but the absolute value of this, um, of this complex number. That's to say the length of that segment. Furthermore, if you want to think about it, you can think, you can also get the phase response of it. It's the angle of this thing. So if you care about phases, which people will eventually will make you care about, but you don't have to worry about it yet. Uh, but you know how to get the phase out of this diagram, too. Yeah? So is Q fixed up there? Yeah. Fixed in space right there? Yeah. And as Z travels around, Z minus Q will frequently? Yeah, that's right. So Q is the filter parameter. It's the filter coefficient. It's the knob. Z is the frequency that you're thinking about going through the filter. And this is a way of thinking about for all possible values of Z, what does the filter do to it? And the answer is it multiplies it by that. This. This, okay, so this, this part of the diagram is explaining why this part of the diagram makes sense. Okay, so this is the real response of the filter, but this is harder to think about because this point is moving around. This point is not fixed. It's easier to think about the thing just rotating the whole thing by z so that this point is fixed and this point is moving instead of having this point fixed and this point moving, although you could think about it either way. This is the way engineers think about it. Now, the punchline to this is, well, there are two punchlines. First off, if I took a bunch of filters and put them in a series, only if I put them in series, parallel would be a mess, but series, right? Um, and if all of them had this form, then I could say what happened, then I could tell you what the frequency response of the whole mess was, because you would simply multiply the frequency response of each stage in turn. So now we can analyze the behavior of complicated filters using the behavior of simple filters. Or, to put it another way, that could give us some way of designing complicated filters, because we might want to design a filter with several stages in order to accomplish something or other. And of course, we're not really going to go there, but that's, but that's a thing that people think about. The other cool thing is this. Going back to the beginning of the lecture, I, uh, th this is non-recirculating filters. But of course, I told you and showed you that recirculating filters can be thought of as the inverse of non-recirculating filters. So here's the non-recirculating filter. And the recirculating filter, which is the inverse of that, is this filter. I have to go forward one. Oops, I have to go forward two, sorry. Where's the, oh, I don't have the, sorry, I didn't have the diagram. All right, never mind that. But you know what it, you, you know what it should look like? It should look like this, except that we're recirculating the output to the in, the output of the delay line to the input, and we're multiplying by Q and adding at the input of the, of the delay line instead of subtracting at the output. Or to put it, to put it another way, we can go back to the patch 
that realizes that. This is the recirculating filter where we are delaying, we're multiplying by something and then we're adding. This is the non-recirculating one where we're delaying, we're multiplying by a thing minus the thing and adding. In other words, we're multiplying by something and subtracting. And those two things are inverses. And what that implies is that for the recirculating filter, the frequency response is the length of this segment. And for a recir sorry, for a non-recirculating filter, I don't know what I said, but I'll say it correctly now at least. For a non-recirculating filter, the, the frequency response is the length of the segment, which changes as z changes, which, which encodes the frequency. And for a recirculating one, the inverse of it, the frequency response is 1 over this. So the non-recirculating filter has a notch right where Q points towards Z, and the recirculating one has a peak where that happens. And what's, what's the smallest value that this thing can be? What's the, small, the shortest the segment can be? It's when Q lines right up with Z, and so that is 1 minus the absolute value of Q. In other words, the, the amount that Q fails to be uh, right, at the, right on the unit circle. And so what that shows is that the recirculating filter has a greater and greater gain. The closer Q gets to the unit circle, the greater the gain of the recirculating filter is right at, uh, right at the choice of Z, which lines up with Q. So the angle of Q chooses the uh, chooses either the notch frequency of the non-recirculating filter or the resonant frequency of the recirculating filter. And the absolute value of Q, this radius here, called R, is going to control where the resonant frequency or notch frequency is. So with those two rules, uh, you can, and with a lot of messing around, you can design filters to any kind of specifications you want, just by, just by making um, assemblies of recirculating and non-recirculating filters with various coefficients. But in, in particular, you can do the thing that I showed you last time, which is you can make a recirculating filter that resonates at any given frequency. And the way I described that last time was you just take a, um, you just, the way I described it last time was, you know what the impulse response should be. It should look like a damped sinusoid. And I know how to make a damped sinusoid because I can just make this funny recirculating uh, complex filter. And I, you know, and just by pure thought, you can think about what the, uh, what the impulse response of that should be, which is <laughs> ringing. And therefore, uh, and therefore, that recirculating delay line would, would act as a resonant filter. Now what I'm doing is showing you analytically why that same recirculating delay line acts as a resonant filter. Right. It's the same filter as I made last time, but I'm coming at it with a completely different line of reasoning now. This is the correct line of reasoning in the sense that now uh, you, you can take this and, and actually go compute things, whereas what I showed you last time is just sort of a uh, phenomenological explanation of what's going on. It's like picking shells up on the beach or something. Questions about this? This is pretty much it for filter theory, I think. Yeah, because I don't know how to I don't know how to tell you much more without well it, after that it's, it's just details but the details go on and on and on. For instance, how would you design now a peaking filter, which is a filter that. Uh, around a resonant, around a, uh, an area here has a little bump that either bumps up or bumps down, but around the rest of the circle is basically one-ish? Well, the answer is you put a recirculating filter and a non-recirculating filter with their coefficients on this at the same angle. Put, the, put them rather close to each other, and therefore anyone out here is about the same distance from both of them, and therefore the gain there is about one because the two signals are the same, uh, the two distances are almost the same, you're dividing because one's recirculating and one's not. But in this neighborhood, if you put one of them closer than the other, then you can make the thing have a positive or negative gain, depending on the ratio of the two distances. And that's your peaking filter. And reasoning like that. Just, um, you can make it as complicated as you want, but 
But it's, it's thoughts like that that, that make it get you through all the elementary filters that people use every day in, in computer music. So this, is, so this is a much better way of thinking about it than is the sort of phenomenological, here's the, you know, make something that rings because you can actually make, do reasoning on this complex plane in, in a way that would allow you to actually figure out how you would make a filter do something that you want. Oh, and furthermore, I just told you that, uh, how to make a peaking filter. It's, it's a filter and it's inverse. Uh, it's, it's, it's a recirculating and a non-recirculating filter. Now, if you set the two coefficients to be exactly the same, those, those filters are exact inverses. And so that's how you get away with putting all these filters in series in an audio chain. It's, it's actually true that when you set the gain of a, of a peaking filter to 0 dB, neither up nor down, so that the pole and 0 are in exactly the same place. Sorry, the recirculating and non-recirculating coefficients are exactly the same. The filter is unity. It, it is as if there were no filter there at all. And you can put a hundred of those things in series and you won't change the original signal. And so that's why you can actually have things like uh, graphic equalizers that don't completely destroy your signal. It's because each one of those filters is actually nothing if, if, if you zero it out. Yep. Questions about this? Nope. All right. So that's filter design. And study with, well, study with Tom or Shlomo and learn, you know, learn all the, all the deep stuff if you want to go further in this. Now what I'm going to do is drop this entire line of inquiry and start talking about graphics. Yeah. So the graduate students who are in the computer music track, are they taking like complex analysis and all these things that <laughs> yeah, this is called the z-plane. <laughs> uh, just because one uses the letter z to, use, to describe the complex number on the unit circle. Um, and yeah, indeed. <laughs> this is something that I wake up every morning wondering about. So. All right, good. Yep. And the good news is, you didn't, oh, where were we? You didn't have to know any calculus to do this. You do have to know complex arithmetic. That's to say you have to understand about angles and, and magnitudes of complex numbers. But you don't need calculus. Although sometimes calculus helps later on. Because it's all high school mathematics. In fact, um, I've probably already said this, but this is the reason high school mathematics is interesting. It's so that you can do computer music. <laughs> you, you cannot do banking using... I mean, bankers don't do algebra or geometry, but... Computer musicians use that all the time, and this is exactly how it comes up. So people should be teaching computer music in high school because that would make the mathematics interesting and make it stick with people. But that will only matter if you become a high school mathematics teacher in your features. Okay, so I'm going to save this. And I've pretty much finished making all the point that I want to make about this, so now we're going to go work with graphics. Now, I have to to tell you something about graphics programming, which is that I don't do a lot of it, so I'm not exactly the right person to teach you this. Um, the, you'll see. <laughs> I can't make great examples because I'm not a person that does this kind of thing, and there are a lot of people who do. Okay, so I'm going to quit here, um, and I'm actually going to change direction directories and furthermore, I'm going to run Jim and not PD. All right. First thing about Jim, you, you probably already see this. Um, when you start up, if you've downloaded PD Extended as opposed to PD, then you have Jim. And in fact, when PD Extended starts up, you see all this kind of stuff. This is, this is PD reading or loading Jim. Um, Jim is a huge light, well, huge. Jim is a library that's larger than PD, I believe, that PD reads and uses to define a whole collection of new objects. Um, okay. <laughs> no, uh, describing that depends on my having said something I didn't say, which is that um, PD, most of the objects that I've shown you have been built-in objects. In fact, I think all of them have been. But you can 
if you type a, the name of something in PD that PD doesn't know about, and if it's not an abstraction, that's to say if it's not the name of a patch, another thing that it could be is the name of a file, which is an object file, which PD will load in to, to define a new object. So you can make objects in PD that, that, um, that are C code that fit inside boxes and do things that you want them to do instead of the things that I thought you might want to do with the built-in objects of PD. Uh, Jim is the, okay, so the, the name stands for the Graphics Environment for Multimedia. Uh, this is by Mark Danks and it's now managed by Hanna, Johannes Zmulnig. Um, and all these names are, are also people who work on this. And the, what Jim is, is a collection of something like 200 objects that um, pertain to graphics in some way or another. Graphics in Jim land is, uh, the, is the thing which is called OpenGL. OpenGL is a, it's the name of either a worldview or of an API which uh, regards computer graphics as being drawing polygons in space. That sounds really stupid until you, uh, until you find out what you can actually do with it, which is not drawing polygons in space, but is drawing one polygon in space and, and, and pasting images onto it. So I'll show you how all this works. So, so computer graphics basically, uh, th there, there are two points of view on computer graphics. One is the 3D point of view, which is everything is a model and the thing that you do is you, is you make a dinosaur or something like that. It's a, bun a dinosaur is just a bunch of triangles which are a bunch of vertices which are points in space and then a bunch of segments between them that describe polygons. Right? And then um, if you want to actually paint a nice, or sorry, render a nice dinosaur on your screen, it's called rendering, uh, you, for each one of those triangles that is described, uh, you ask the computer to, to paint a picture of that triangle except, of course, if it's occluded by, or wholly or partially occluded by some triangle that's in front of it, then you would paint the one in front of it in, in that place instead of the one behind. So you do hiding and all that, all that kind of stuff. And this is exceedingly popular as a way of presenting computer, or wait, as a way of thinking of computer graphics, um, basically because of the influence of two industries. One is Hollywood, which started making uh, high high-budget, uh, three-dimensional rendered um, animated films uh, like Toy Story or Up or I forget what. Um, and the other thing is computer games, which, you know, they're the interesting computer games and the stupid computer games. The interesting ones are the ones that, that have a thought component to them and the stupid ones are the ones where you're chasing things around and shooting at them, right? <laughs> and if you want to make a computer game where you sh chase something around and shoot at it, uh, uh, it turns out that 3D rendering is a very good way of, of making that appear realistic. <coughs> and so, right, and so basically the first person shooter games, FPS games, and Hollywood movies are the basic reason to have three dimensional graphics. Now, personally, turn your ears off because I'm going to express an aesthetic opinion here. I think both of those things are aesthetically bankrupt. But they're there, and furthermore, they're a multi-billion dollar industry. So if you know how to do this kind of stuff, you can actually make money at it. Um, now, okay, Jim is OpenGL, which is the Open Graphics Library, which is, was originally called the Graphics Library. It's one of two or three competing um, APIs, which is say worldviews for doing 3D rendering. Um, however, all of the 3D rendering things ended up having to, to work with images as well. So wh why isn't all that stuff images? Well, because as I told you but then got lost trying to explain, there really are two points of view on, on, on making pictures with computers. One is draw a 3D model, which is what OpenGL and these other things is designed to do. And the other is to think of it as the screen, as, as painting on a screen. In other words, the screen consists of a bunch of pixels, it's flat, and what you're really doing is you're concerned with the, with the color of each of the pixels. And then the tools that are of interest are video cameras, because video cameras make images, they don't make 3D models. And, and tools like compositing, which is to say taking 
um, taking one image and, and painting onto it with another image, um, which could, by the way, be the image of a, of, of a blob made by a paintbrush, so that you could regard painting as a, as a compositing operation where you put, you know, put bits of one image, which is actually just paint, onto another image, which is the thing, that, the canvas that you're painting on. So, um, OpenGL has a huge facility for doing image processing in this second sense, which is called texture mapping. Why? Because the only reason for doing images, if you're, if you're back in chasing dinosaurs around um, in, in some computer game, the, the reason for having images is so that you can paint the images onto the skins of, of the dinosaurs to, to make them look scaly. And that's called texture mapping. Right, so you don't, don't really want to have your dinosaur look like a bunch of green polygons running around. You want it to look like dinosaur skin. And so what you do is you go hire an artist to make, to make a picture of what dinosaur skin might look like. And then you take that picture and you tile it onto the body of the dinosaur all over it in a way that doesn't make it obvious that it's repeating. And that's called texture mapping. So to make a 3D picture, is, is this stuff you all know? Yeah. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so maybe I'm repeating things here. So, so to make a 3D image, really, you, you make a model, and, but then you paint a texture onto the model, and the texture is an image. And so there are image processing things which are uh, basically there for you to be able to do texture mapping, but they, are, they allow you also to do things like taking in parts of images and, and compositing them onto other images and stuff like that. And those are the cool things that you can do with Jim, as it turns out, um, at least from my point of view. So now what I'm going to attempt to do, and this is dangerous because I don't really know what I'm doing, is, is show you the basic tools in Jim for, for making shapes and, and then for mapping textures onto them. And um, just to maximize the embarrassment, I'm going to do this from, from nothing so that you can see everything that you have to do in order to make a, a Jim object. And then I'll fall back on some prepared ones because you'll see. It's, things don't just work the first time in Jim because there are more details to, to keep track of than there are in audio land. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to make a new window. And before I do anything, I'm going to save it. And it's going to be 0, Jim, try this. And I'm going to call it .pd, even though maybe it should be called .gym, because we're really, it's going to be a PD patch, but there are going to be a bunch of new objects which are gym objects. Okay, so the first one is going to be this thing, whoa, sorry. Not that kind of new, this kind of new. First thing is going to be we need a window to put the graphics output in. And there's an object called JimWin whose function, whose purpose in life is to maintain a window that will be the image that, um, that PD makes. And it takes messages, and messages are something like uh, dimension which allows you to say how big you want the thing to be. So maybe 300x by 200y. I'm going to make it really small because my screen doesn't have much resolution. Um, and that is just going to tell the gym window what, how, big it's, how big a thing it should make. And then there's a create message that makes it. And there will be a destroy message that gets rid of it. There's other stuff here that I have that I'm not telling you about. Okay, so tell it what dimension then create a window and ta-da, we have now a nice window, yeah, which is just being a window that doesn't know what it's doing. Right? It's just sitting there being a space on the screen. It's um, it isn't even being managed by the window manager right now. All right, now next. Ooh, sorry. Next thing to do is to be able to throw it messages to start it and stop it and. Uh, the usual thing, the obvious thing to do would be to, to say, just put a toggle. So you can send it the number one, and the number one starts it rendering. It even said so. So now it's rendering, which means that it can redraw itself, and it, it's just redrawing black every time it gets redrawn now. All right? And then if I turn it off, then it's not rendering anymore, and then it's just being catatonic again, like it was before. Okay. Now, me, when I'm making patches, I don't do this, I do this. It turns out that as soon as you create a window, it's time to start rendering. And, it's <laughs> and if you want to stop rendering, you probably want to get rid of the window, too. 
So I always just do that. Create an on or an off in the story. Now, making objects. So I told you everything's a polygon, right? So I'm going to. I'm going to get out a, a, I'm going to show you a, an easy to manage polygon which won't do much for you and then I'll show you an, a complicated polygon that will do more stuff for you but will take a lot of work. The easy one is a rectangle and the complicated one is a triangle. Why? Because rectangle, uh, actually, rec well, I'll show you. So rectangle is this. We'll say rectangle and then we'll give it dimensions. And then we got to say, and here, here's the thing that I always have trouble explaining, but I'll just try to explain it. Now what you need is to have the, in some sense, the equivalent of the ADC tilde object, the thing which just starts things rolling. So rectangle is, um, is, a, is an object which doesn't, hmm, looks like it has an output, but it doesn't. Um, it's at the bottom of a chain of things that we will do, which is we will first off make a, a source of messages that will go down this chain of objects, and eventually the chain will terminate in the rectangle, which is the command to draw something. The top of the thing is an artificial object, which is called gem head. And so you will have a gem head at the top of everything, which is called a gem chain. And now we have a rectangle. Um, and, you know, this is insulting your intelligences, but rectangles have dimensions. And so now we've got graphics, right? Okay, so now you can immediately tell that you could make patches that have abstractions, have thousands or millions of these things, and you could start making Piet Mondrian paintings and stuff like that. In fact, you could do anything with this now, almost. Okay, now, this is however, a little bit stupid because the rectangle is white and there's some other things stupid about it. Oh, let me tell you something that, um, something good to know. The dimensions in Jim, roughly speaking, okay, everything is in three dimensions, although you don't see it yet. And this rectangle is on the z equals zero plane. So z is this direction. Z is positive towards you and negative away from you, I hope. I'll, I'll find out if I'm wrong. Uh, and this is y and this is x. And at z equals 0, you can see x and y, if I remember correctly, between positive and negative 3. Now, why positive and negative 3? That's because that's the way the coordinate system is set up. It's a thing that you could change, but you, you think of that as the, uh, as the camera. In other words, there's a, there's a virtual camera looking at this scene, and the camera has a particular lens length and all that kind of stuff, but it is such that this, this range is from plus to minus 3 at z equals 0. Uh, let's see if that's actually true. So I'll make the thing 3. Oh, right. And 3 means uh, 3 units wide, so I make it 6 units wide to fill the screen. Yeah, so 6 is right where it filled. So there's that. Now, first thing that you might wish to do, well, there are a bunch, um, would be to change the color. Anyway, it's a thing. In, it's a thing you'll eventually wish to do. So, now, now we start with all the 200 objects. Well, I've shown you three objects. Now we'll start with the other 197. So, how about color? RGB. This is a. Yeah. Now I have to say, very soon I'm going to have to go consulting the help files because all these objects have complicated, have lots of inlets and they have lots of complicated things that you can do with them. But right now I'm just going to to fly with this and hope for the best. So if I remember correctly, R, G, and B are actually the these three inlets. And their values range from 0 to 1. I'll find out if this is right or not as soon as I start doing this. So I'm wrong. All right, you can change that to 1. I'm going to get rid of this. 
we're going to just not know what the last inlet does and do this instead. <laughs> right. So now, okay, so this is uh, also confusing because the color is, is white, which is R, G, and B are all equal to 1 to start with, and so I had to actually send it zeros in order to turn it off. The inlets do not necessarily start out at zero in gen, although they almost always will in, in PD. So here's red. Here's green. No. Wait, no. I'm sorry. Here's green. Ta-da. And of course blue. And now everyone knows this, but take red and green and you get you. Sort of yellow. There, yellow. <laughs> uh, right, so this is video color rules where, where colors add, they don't subtract. Okay, that isn't yellow either, is it? It's better than the other. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, yeah, and exactly what color you get depends on your projector or your screen and blah, blah, blah. In fact, I, I have a radically different color here than what you're looking at. But, okay, so there's all that. All right, so now what is happening here is the following thing. And this is a thing. Maybe you all can understand this, but this is a thing that I find very, very mysterious. The way GL thinks and the way Jim plays into GL. So GL is the API, or OpenGL is the API that Jim is talking to. API is, the, is an application's programming interface, and that's just a bunch of function calls, right, as far as we're concerned. Um, the way the API thinks about life is you don't just render things. So this is rendering a rectangle here, and you can say render a rectangle, but before you render the rectangle, you're allowed to do all kinds of nonsense, like which are called trans transformations. Transformations are things like um, rotating or translating the object in space, changing its color. Now, why is that a transformation? I don't know, but it is. And making it not opaque, making it partly transparent. And worse yet, uh, unbelievably wrong, but this is not Mark Danks' fault. This is OpenGL's design. It's just weird. A another transformation of an object consists of saying what texture it's going to have mapped onto it as it's rendered. So to put it another way, um, but you, you, you go waltzing down this gym chain until you get to the last thing, which is, which is a command to draw something. That's a, um, uh, it's a drawing command, but you collect all sorts of detritus along the way, and the detritus is things like rotations, translations, color changes, transparency changes, and textures. All right, so I'll so this right now is the color thing, and I believe it's true that we could do it again, and it would simply replace the color with the new one. I shouldn't even be doing this, but we'll see. Okay. So now this color is white. Yeah. So this color simply overwrote that color. All right. Uh, okay, so as I told you, you can translate or rotate. So how about translate XYZ? Sorry, this is painfully stupid, isn't it? And now, ta-da! Um, while we're here, if you, want to, if you want to do animations, the obvious way to think about doing animations is to make an object and then start it flying around. Don't do that. It's just, it's just stupid, right? I mean, this is, a, this is a stupid animation. Good animation is, think, is representing motion by drawing things in sequence, which is not the, th that's the same thing as drawing a thing and making it move around. <laughs> okay. But, but the people who designed OpenGL were convinced that the right way to animate something would be just to make something and make it fly around. And so there are all these wonderful things in OpenGL for making things fly around. The next one, of course, we have translations, but of course we also are going to have to have rotations. And this one, I think you can actually say rotate XYZ. 
No, you can't. Oh, wait, it has to be capitals. No. No, but why can't I draw? Why can't I make oh, caps lock. Ta da! Okay, excellent. Uh, so, rotation, there are many ways that you could represent a rotation, but one possible way is as a three vector. By the way, it's a complete coincidence that the same number of color dimensions is the same thing as the number of spatial dimensions. That didn't have to be true. It just, that's, our eyes didn't have to actually choose the number three, but they, but that's the number we have right now. Okay, so rotating about um, x, y, z is the following thing. You specify a vector, and the magnitude of the vector is going to be the amount of rotation, and what units do you suppose OpenGL would have proposed for that? If colors are going to be from 0 to 1, the obvious thing to do is have the rotations be in degrees, right? <laughs> no, but that's what they did. So, uh, so for instance, if you want to rotate by, if you want to rotate the thing in the plane that you're looking at, what you're doing is you're rotating about the z-axis. In other words, you have to describe the, the vector normal to which you're rotating. And furthermore, the length of that vector is going to be how much you're rotating. So here is rotating in about a z. And notice, by the way, some crud in the, in the image. This, this staircase thing, that's called aliasing, and that's bad. Uh, if you, you can fix that, but I'm not going to show you just right now. Um, the other thing, then, is you can also rotate by other axes, and now suddenly you get to see the fact that we are being three-dimensional. Okay, now, this is, this is a perspective drawing of, of the nice rectangle whose top edge is pointing <coughs> out toward you and whose bottom edge is pointing away from you. And, and compound rotations, you know, can do compound things, right? Now, this is interesting for about 30 seconds, and then it's profoundly boring. So, um, there's, well, okay, so next. <laughs> uh, I'm going to make two of these so that you can see how Jim thinks that things should uh, superpose. Let's see now what's happening. So this one, they're the same size. I'm going to rotate this one. Yeah, there we go. Oh my. Um, I have to tell you something about my computer. <laughs> the, uh, a pixel in this direction isn't the same size as a pixel in this direction. Oh wait. Well, anyway, the, um, I didn't tell it to make a square window. That, probably that's what's really going on right now, is that since my window isn't square, in fact, why don't I make the window square? Because I'm going to be confusing here. So you would never actually make a square window, but I'll make a square one so that, oh, so that you still only see the aspect ratio problem. Okay, so this shape should be the same as that shape, and I think it's not, but I think that's because my aspect ratio is messed up. The aspect ratio is, the, is whether the whether pixels are square or rectangular. Okay. Um, all right, so now we have two things. Now, who said that the yellow rectangle is behind the white rectangle? I don't like white. Let's make that one red. Oh, but I can't. Oh, thanks. Okay. All right. Okay. So why is the yellow one behind the red one? Because I did this first. <laughs> you, uh, that's not good. It would be better to tell these gym heads in what order they should be rendered. What's really happening is that the yellow rectangle is being rendered first and then the red rectangle is being rendered so that even though they are at exactly the same location in three-dimensional space, the red one shows up on top. You can actually specify that by putting numbers here which are priorities which basically describe <coughs> the order in which the, the, the things are going to be rendered. Um, but rather than worry about that right now, I'm going to start translating again in the z direction. 
I'm translating the yellow one, and I'm going to move it toward us and then away from us. And then you get to watch, you know, uh, what is that? That's um, Z-plane, Z not Z-buffering, I guess is what you call this, right? Where, you, where one thing is in front of or behind another one. Okay. Or, to belabor the point horribly, let's take this thing and rotate it about X. Right? And now we have, you know, sort of an engineering drawing where we have this piece of metal going through a slot on this piece of metal or something like that. Right? Okay. Now this is basically this is this is the way uh, this is the way 3D rendering works. It's, you, you draw stuff and then stuff occludes other stuff. That's, that's the basic deal. Okay. Now comes the risky part. Uh, let's start putting textures on these things. And the reason for wanting to do this is so that we can actually start working with images, which is much more interesting than working with shapes in space. At least in my opinion. So to do that, and this is really st strange, I guess. It's not really stupid, but it's just strange. So I'm going to, to do yet another thing, which is to tell the thing that it has a texture. Now, oh, it's called pix underscore texture. And what's the texture going to be? Okay, now what this thing does, pix texture, is it says, whatever the image is, that's what you're going to texture map on. But what is the image? There's no way to specify that directly. And so what you do is you just say, Part of the environment that we're in is that there is a current image, and the image is going to be set by pix underscore image this object. And furthermore, this object takes a message. This is never going to work. Okay, so we're going to do a message, and it's going to be open test one dot jpeg. So I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to try to explain what it is. So pix image is a thing which is uh, which is memory, which con contains an image, which we can read an image in, and it didn't work. Texture couldn't create. Okay, so why can't I do this? Maybe because you know what? I'm going to cheat. I'm going to go look and see. And look and see what I did the other time. So you say pix image open pix texture. There's nothing wrong with this. So temp one. Temp one. Oh, temp one. So why didn't I get an error message? Oh, right. The error message goes. Right. I got this earlier today and forgot. The error message gets thrown on the standard error. <laughs> bad, 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 bad. Okay. Okay, so we're going to say temp1.jpg. And then, did we get anything? Three and blah, 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 blah. Okay, it's happy. Where's the rendering window? It's gone because I. There! Ha! <laughs> And now, okay, so let me go back and make this thing be white. So that you can see the image in all its glory. There's the image. It's a stupid image, but you know, someone found it somewhere on the web. Mark, I think, found it on the web somewhere. And now what's happening is this image is being texture mapped onto that nice rectangle. Okay, so the, the operation is done in the following way. You, you have a pix image, which is a, which is a buffer which contains the image. And pix image's job is simply to say, all right, if anyone needs an image, I got an image and it's in this buffer. And then pix texture's job is to say, has anyone got an image? If so, let's texture map it. And of course, the person that's got the image is this one. And so that becomes the image that gets texture mapped. And that's the basic way that this thing gets thought through. Okay. 
Now, images are cool. We're, okay, so where do images come from? Um, images come basically from t three possible places that I'm aware of right now. Um, the medium cool one is files. The really cool one is the camera or your camera. So you can take your camera and make it show up on this thing. Um, and then the uber cool one is you can take two images and composite them into a third image so that you can actually work on various kinds of image synthesis. Like you can take an image and punch it into a part of another image and, and blah, blah, like that. Um, I, I'm not going to have time to describe this in detail today, but I'll try to show you some of these examples next time. And finally, on some OSs, maybe all OSs now, I'm not sure, you can take whatever you just rendered and make that an image and save it, which is a way then of being able to make to paint stuff and, and haul it off screen into an image and then be able to use that as raw material and just in something else. So with all that, then you have a ready source of a whole bunch of images that then you can use in, in recursive ways to, to build up cool, uh, cool visual effects of one sort or another. Yeah. And can this run while you're running like audios? So. Yes. And furthermore, although I'm not ready to talk, well, I don't have time to talk about this because we have two minutes left. Furthermore, the two can be throwing information back and forth at each other. So you can. Um, I tried to get this demo working today and couldn't, but maybe by Thursday I will. You can take the camera and point it at something and turn that into, into sound, like a waveform or a spectrum. Or you can have a sound going into a microphone and have that affect how an image is, is happening. Like, you know, make an image jump around when, this, when, when you have signal coming into a microphone. Um, and this, a lot of people have, have worked hard on, on coming with cool, interesting ways of using this musically and, and visually. And so it's, it's almost a, some people call this visual music when you actually make uh, designs that consist of both images and sound that are changing in time. Although, of course, that's a music-centric name to give it. But the, but the name visual music, I think, dates back almost 100 years now. So it's not like the inventor of Jim thought that term up. Um, yeah, so now you can all go out into, the, into clubs and make money because people will pay to dance to uh, images jumping around on a screen until they suddenly realize that that's not something that you can really dance effectively to and then it'll go out of fashion and then you won't be able to make money this way anymore. <laughs> so more on this next time.